we'll go ahead and get started. This next section is an opportunity for us to hear from Judge Margaret Spencer, who sits on the circuit court here in the city of Richmond. And she's going to share with us uh, her tips for new lawyers when you encounter appellate advocacy. And we are so honored to hear from Judge Spencer this afternoon because before uh, joining the bench uh, here in the city of Richmond, Judge Spencer began her career at the Department of Justice uh, as a prosecutor, uh, later uh, spent the majority of her career for teaching law of College of William Mary and becoming a judge as a member of the Attorney General's office here in the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia, where she exclusively handled uh, appellate issues representing our Commonwealth uh, before the Court of Appeals of Virginia, the Supreme Court of Virginia, uh, handling criminal matters and other matters, uh, and, and representing uh, people of Virginia in the appellate class. And as we'll hear from Judge Spencer this afternoon, as an appellate attorney, your role is really different from that as a trial attorney. If you're really having a conversation with the bench. And so we're so honored now to have a conversation with a member of the bench, Judge Margaret Spencer. Uh, please join me in welcome. Good afternoon. Before I get started, I uh, noticed when I was sitting there, I saw a couple of you looking at your watches. I want you to know that I am keenly aware of the three B's of public speaking on a Friday afternoon at 2.30 when you are next to the last speaker and the weather is nice, and those three Bs are be bright, be brief, and be seated. <laughs> PowerPoint presentation that is uh, very bright. I assure you I can be brief, and I know how to be seated. Um, each of you should have a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that we're going over, and this is really the only thing um, that you need to, to look at. There are other materials, however, uh, and this is a list of the materials that you should have. This PowerPoint presentation is the first one. It's called This 10 Things Presentation. Um, you also have in the materials that were sent to you by the bar a two-page chart, uh, appellate practice filing deadlines um, for both the Court of Appeals and for the Supreme Court of Virginia. Um, you also have a 24-page outline that's the post-trial advocacy and preserving issues for appeal outline. And today, in addition to being handed a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, you are also given a chart as to practice before the Court of Appeals of Virginia. So those are the materials um, that you have that will help you. But basically, you just need the PowerPoint presentation that we're going over. All right, my first thing is know the basics of appellate courts. Um, as, as you've heard, if you're wondering why in the world is a trial court judge talking to us about appellate courts? Well, I spent 15 years doing appellate litigation exclusively, not only for the um, AG's office, but also for the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. I was an attorney in the Civil Rights Division. Um, and as a Department of Justice, attorney in the appellate section, that's all you do. Um, we argued before every federal circuit court of appeal in the country, we did briefs, but we did not handle the cases at, at the trial level. And the ground rules are the same. Um, you really have to know what you're doing. And the, the only thing I want you to remember, assuming you do fall asleep um, before you leave, is that appellate litigation is like jumping in the pool. You have to learn to swim before you jump in the deep end. Um, you have to learn to swim before you jump in the deep, deep end. And that's the difference between appellate and trial work. All right, first thing, uh, before we talk about basics, how many of you did moot court in law school? How many of you did some type of moot court? All right, keep your hands up. How many of you also did some type of appellate litigation clinic? All right, so we have a, a, a fairly good number did neither a moot court, probably limited experience in doing briefs, and probably a limited experience um, in doing oral arguments. Um, well, if you are doing appellate litigation, obviously you have to know about jurisdiction, you have to know about appellate courts. Most of you will probably be doing appellate work in one of these four courts, um, the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. 
Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, which covers Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, or the Supreme Court of Virginia, or the Court of Appeals of Virginia. Now, these are Virginia's two appellate courts, and for those of you who went to an out-of-state law school, you should never, ever make the mistake of saying it is the Virginia Supreme Court. It is not. It is the Supreme Court of Virginia. It is never the Virginia Court of Appeals. It is not. It is the Court of Appeals of Virginia. And basically, you need to be familiar with the jurisdiction as to what types of cases these courts uh, have, jur have jurisdiction over, what they hear, so you'll know what you're doing uh, in the state courts of Virginia. Our Supreme Court is composed of the Chief Justice and six justices. And our Supreme Court has discretionary jurisdiction over non-capital criminal cases and civil cases. It has mandatory jurisdiction over capital cases, death penalty cases, um, state corporation commission cases. And this is a big one for us, attorney and judicial discipline cases. They are not heard by the Supreme Court by petition. They have mandatory jurisdiction. Our Court of Appeals of Virginia has 11 judges, and they have final mandatory jurisdiction over a number of things, over traffic cases, over misdemeanor cases in which no jail time is given, uh, over divorce cases, and over workers' comp cases. They are the court of last resort in the Commonwealth, even though the Court of Appeals is Virginia's intermediate appellate court. Um, they also have discretionary jurisdiction over non-capital criminal cases. So our first tip was to know the basics of the courts. The second tip is to understand exactly what appellate litigation is, exactly the, what is the difference between appellate courts and trial courts. It's simple. Appellate courts are looking for error. Trial courts are looking for truth. Uh, appellate courts are trying to find out what is wrong. Appellate courts are trying to find out what is right. Um, that's the basic difference between appellate courts and, and trial courts. As an appellate, um, before an appellate court, you are trying to convince a panel of justices, uh, a panel of judges, that the trial court did something wrong and you told them that it was wrong. As an appellee, you are trying to convince a panel of judges or a panel of justices that what the trial court did was right, even if there is another reason, whether it's substantive reason or procedural reason, or it's a reason that may be stated or not stated, but you're trying to say the trial court got it right, all right? Now, let's move on to number three, which is a big one in Virginia, the court rules. Uh, as I mentioned, you have an outline, a two-page outline that's in the materials, um, and it's the filing deadlines chart. This outline tells you the what, when, where, and why as to all of the appellate rules. And we used to refer to outlines like this when I was at the Justice Department as cheat sheets. Um, do not be afraid to have a cheat sheet if you are going to jump into the deep end of the pool um, because you need to know what's due and when it's due. There's another resource that you do not have in the materials that I've provided, um, but you can get it on the Virginia State Bar's website. Um, it's a little out of date because they have not revised it since 2011, but it's called the Revised Handbook on Appellate Advocacy in the Supreme Court of Virginia and the Court of Appeals of Virginia. And you can download, download it if you go on the Virginia State Bar's <coughs> website. In the upper right-hand corner, um, they have a, a publication uh, link. You click on Publications and you go down to this document. It will say revised. Uh, hopefully, by the time you click on it, it may say 2012 or 2013. Last night it said 2011, so I didn't change it. All right, our number three thing, again, is comply with the rules. It is an understatement to say that the rules are important in appellate practice because the rules govern everything. In July of 2010, the rules were amended to add Rule 5, colon 1, A, B. And this is a rule that says you can be reported to the Virginia State Bar if you don't comply with the rules and your case is dismissed. If your appeal is dismissed because you don't comply with the rules, it is not mandatory, it's discretionary, but there's a new rule as of July 1st, 2010 that says the Supreme Court 
can report you to the Virginia State Bar. I do not know if the Supreme Court has ever reported any attorney in the last two years to the State Bar. The Supreme Court has dismissed lots of appeals. Um, the Court of Appeals has dismissed lots of appeals. If you look at the chart, the cheat sheet that I was referring to, you'll notice that there are some things that are mandatory and your appeal will be, will be dismissed. Uh, I don't know why this rule um, was adopted, but it exists and you just need to be aware of it. Um, and if we're talking about what can get your case dismissed, let's look at the next slide that talks about a couple of new things, mandatory procedural requirements. In 2010, um, rule 517 was amended and Rule 5A12 was also amended. Uh, in the rules of the Supreme Court of Virginia, Part 5 relates only to the Supreme Court of Virginia. Part 5A relates only to the Court of Appeals of Virginia. And both of them have rules governing the petition for appeal because as I told you, some of the jurisdiction is discretionary. And in 2010, both of these rules were amended to say there must be an exact page reference to where the alleged error was preserved in the trial court. And this exact page reference must be stated in the petition for appeal. Um, there can be no broad references to a group of pages. Um, there must be an exact page reference. Well, what happens if a party does not comply with the rules? In 2012, there were about five cases decided in which the court dismissed an appeal. And again, we're going back to the question, well, did the court report these attorneys to the bar? We don't know. Um, but it seems like this is something new that you should be aware of. Um, in Chapman versus Commonwealth, um, which was a, a case that was decided in August of 2012, um, the case involved three consolidated criminal appeals. And in one case, there was no page reference to the alleged error uh, in the petition for appeal. In another, page, in another case, there was a very broad reference. And in a third case, there was a general assignment of error that said the trial judge uh, lacked insufficient evidence to convict this defendant in a bench trial. Uh, well, in Chapman, the Supreme Court dismissed the appeal um, it said we not only are dismissing the appeal as opposed to denying the appeal, and you understand the difference, when the appeal is dismissed, the court lacks jurisdiction to even consider it, so you cannot ask for a reconsideration. Um, but the court also said, once we tell you that you have made this mistake, you can't amend the petition to just insert a page reference. Um, so that's why the mandatory procedural requirements are important, because these rules. There are rules that govern mandatory dismissal, um, but these rules also say, well, the Supreme Court can report you to the state bar. Um, these two rules, 517 and 5812, mandate dismissal of a petition for failure to comply with the requirement. Something else that's new in the last couple of years, e-filing. How many of you have had any experience with e-filing so far in Virginia state or federal courts? Uh, and how many of you have had that experience solely in federal court? All right, and, and tell everybody else why. Because that's all they pay. Um, that's what federal courts do now. You may have to give the paper copy to Judge James Spencer, um, but the court takes only e-filing. There is no other option. Well, the Supreme Court in 2010 decided that all briefs um, have to be e-filed. They amended Rule 526 to impose an electronic filing requirement for every brief that's filed in the Supreme Court of Virginia. Um, and one electronic copy must be filed with the clerk. You can either do it by sending in the CD-ROM or you can email it to the clerk. Uh, the email address is in the rule. And again, this is new and failure to comply with it may result in dismissal of your appeal, and it may result in a reporting to the Virginia State Bar. Um, but it's clear what the rule says, if you don't comply with it, if they don't dismiss the appeal, that there is no oral argument without good cause. Now, the Court of Appeals in Virginia has not come this far to say that every brief has to be um, e-filed. They do have e-filing requirements in the Court of Appeals 
for petitions for a hearing. Uh, rule 5A33, which is your regular petition for a hearing, and Rule 5A34, which is your petition for a hearing for in bank reconsideration, um, both have e filing requirements. All right, let's look at number four. Know the facts, know the record. Um, now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the MKP rule. Um, when you are a Justice Department attorney, you have nothing to do with the trial of a case somewhere out in East Split, Oklahoma. But they fly you out there to handle the appeal. And in the Justice Department, they tell you we don't hire um, good lawyers. Good lawyers are average. We hire exceptional lawyers. And exceptional lawyers have to be the most knowledgeable person in the appellate courtroom, um, the most knowledgeable person who is filing a brief. Even though the appellate lawyer from the Justice Department had absolutely nothing to do with the case. And if you're going to practice appellate litigation, it should be your goal to also be the most knowledgeable person in the courtroom. And being the most knowledgeable person in the courtroom means you have to know the facts. Um, there's no getting around it. You have to know where something is in the transcript. You have to know where something is in the record. You have to be able to say why this is relevant, why this is not, not relevant, um, because you will at, be asked that question. At the Justice Department, we had no option because the, the, the federal judges knew that this was our area of expertise. We only did appellate work. We only did civil rights litigation. Um, most of you, if you're doing appellate work, and for example, if you're not doing it in the AG's office, you're doing appellate work in a number of different types of cases. <coughs> But when you represent the United States Department of Justice, you're, from, you're either from the Civil Rights Division, the Antitrust Division, and you only do that type of work, so you're the expert. And I want you all to think of it the way we had to think of it. They would tell us, well, you represent the public, so when you go to the grocery store, that's your client. Um, when you look on television, all of those people are your client. Every citizen in the United States is your client, and you do not want the lady down to let the lady down who's in the grocery store behind you because you represent her because you are the Justice Department attorney. And if you're doing appellate work, um, think of all of those people as your potential client, and we'll get to why this is important. Um, you're not representing the public if you're doing appellate work as a private litigator, but you want to be the most knowledgeable person in the courtroom when you stand up and argue. There can be no stammering, there can be no stuttering, there can be no shuffling through papers. You have to have the knowledge, and it takes time. Uh, it takes time. That's why you have to learn how to swim before you, you jump into the, the water. And a lot of us learn the hard way because we had no option. Uh, we were told that you represent the public, and if you want to do a good job, just think of everybody that you see as your potential client. All right. Obviously, knowing the facts is important, but you have to know the law. There are four reasons and four reasons only. Nobody will ever tell you differently why appellate courts that don't have mandatory jurisdiction will accept a case for an appeal. This applies to the United States Supreme Court, to all of the federal appellate courts. There are only four reasons why any appellate court, given the option to accept or reject a case, will accept a case, and those are the four reasons that are up there. And if you think of every appellate case you can think of, they fit into one of these four categories. Uh, appellate courts accept cases because they want to explain an earlier decision. I mean, if you look at, for example, the Darwin case on expert opinions, and then you look at Kumo Tire and all the cases after that, they are explaining an earlier decision. Appellate courts want to clarify or to explain an area of the law that they think is complex. Now, punitive damages. Uh, if they think it's something complicated about it and you are an appellate, help them see that it's complicated. Appellate courts also want to resolve a conflict among the trial courts or a conflict among lower appellate courts. And they obviously look at new issues. So if you are an appellate attorney, before you jump into the water, if you want to swim and you are seeking review of a discretionary issue, it has to fit into one of these categories. And you have to know the law in order for it to fit into one of these categories. 
What do we mean by knowing the law? It means being the MKP, the most knowledgeable person. You have to know that you argue in a public course by analogy. There are some cases that are close to your case. These are the cases, this is the precedent that you want to say, these cases support my argument. There are some cases that are contrary to whatever it is you want the court to do. These are the cases that you have to distinguish, and you know you have to distinguish them. Um, and uh, uh, appellate work is a lot of research. Those of us who are appellate attorneys at Maine Justice and in the state e AG's office, we spend a lot of time by ourselves. We loved our computers. Uh, it's like real estate agents say, location, location, location. We say research, 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 um, because you're always arguing by analogy. Uh, public litigation focuses on the law. Trial litigation focuses on facts. Um, so if you're focusing on the law, you have to know it. And you have to be the MKP as to the facts and the MKP as to the law. Number six, assignments of error. Um, one of the cases that came down last year in the uh, Court of Appeals was a case in which the Commonwealth of Virginia was denied an appeal because the Attorney General's office made a mistake and called the assignments of error um, questions presented. I think that was the Commonwealth case that was on that prior slide about your appeal could get dismissed. Um, don't make mistakes about assignments of error. And the, the most important rule is to know that you have to raise it or it's waived. And that's our contemporaneous objection rule. The outline that you have in the materials, I think the first five pages of the outline talk about the contemporaneous objection rules. Uh, if an error or, or a reference to an error is not raised at the trial court level, it is waived. And again, the new rules, 517 for the Supreme Court, 5812 for the Court of Appeals, say that you have to not only clearly state um, the assignment of error, but you clear, have to clearly state the standard of review that's applicable to this particular assignment of error. And those of you that did record or appellate litigation in law school, you are familiar with the standard of review. Let's get to the brief. What in the world do we mean by writing and appealing brief? Trial lawyers tend to be repetitive. They want to make sure that they are heard. They don't understand the rule that you stand up to be seen, you speak up to be heard, you sit down to be appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, appellate lawyers have to, have to know that. Um, you have to understand the importance of brevity, the importance of clarity, the importance of being precise and concise. Remember that brief means brief. That's, that's what it means. Brief means brief. The Court of Appeals has a page limit. It is now 12,300, I'm sorry, the word limit it is now 12,300 words. They also have a page limit. The Supreme Court has a page and a word limit. Uh, the page limit is 50 pages, but the Supreme Court's word limit is 8,750 words. And you learned how to write in law school. You went to law school um, because you enjoyed writing. Don't forget that once you become an appellate lawyer because you're focusing on trial and appellate work. Um, remember everything you learned. How many of you went to William and Mary? How many of you did legal skills and hated it? All right. Don't forget what you learned while you were hating legal skills. Um, <laughs> don't forget what you learned about good writing. Um, I, I taught at William and Mary, and they used to call it legal thrills. Why? You do not want this information to be published uh, in Westlaw or Lexis, and everybody will look up the decision and realize that it's about you. Uh, in 2008, the Court of Appeals issued a decision that just talked about how bad the appellate work was. And this is a quote from the decision. Appellate courts are not unlit rooms where attorneys may wander blindly about hoping to stumble upon a reversible error. Uh, and look at the next one. This is more recent. This was in October of last year, a decision from the Court of Appeals. 
the inefficient use of this court's resources by requiring it to slog through an unorganized brief with redundant arguments, some of which misrepresent the holding of the court below, do no service to the representation of a client seeking serious appellate review of any meritorious issues. When you're doing trial work, the people who are in the courtroom may know what you're doing. Um, maybe the people in the city may know what you're doing. Maybe some of the clerks may know what you're doing, and you can make mistakes. When you're doing appellate work, the world knows. Everybody who can find this case on Westlaw, this was a case out of the city of Richmond, will know who this attorney was. You don't want that. Um, that's why you have to write an appealing brief, because your stuff is public. That's why you have to do it, because the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court, oh, and you should read some of what Scalia writes. Um, they have no problems with telling attorneys that you just did a poor job. You wrote an unorganized brief. The arguments were redundant. You misrepresented the holdings of the trial court. And you did no service to representation of a client seeking serious appellate review of any meritorious issues. Folks, it's public. It's out there for everybody to see. If you want to see who did this, I, I'm not hiding it. The Court of Appeals didn't hide it. The attorney's name is listed at the front of the decision. How can you make, make sure you're doing the best that you can? I will tell you something that um, I, I learned at the Justice Department. And when I became a supervisor, we did the same thing. It's time consuming, but it may be worth your while, especially for those of you who hated legal skills. Um, when I first started, we had to give our briefs hard copy to a supervisor. Our supervisor would read each paragraph of the brief, statement of facts, legal argument. At the end of each paragraph, that would be a fraction, and she always made the fraction in red. The numerator in the fraction would be the number of words that she used. The denominator in the fraction would be the number of words that we used. Um, you really have to proof your brief 4,000 times. Judge Taylor reads his backwards. He starts at the bottom and he comes up and then he reads it front and back. Um, but you really have to be very careful about what you're putting out there now because of Westlaw, Lexis, Internet, the world will see it. And again, all of these people that you see on television are your potential clients. Um, and if you proof your brief and you say, gosh, I can cut out that, that, T-H-A-T. Gosh, I can make four sentences, and don't use legalese, you learned that in law school. I can make four sentences as opposed to eight sentences. Do it. And look at what some of your fractions are in the margin. And if your numerator is smaller than your denominator, then you just need to change your writing style. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it, but you do not want uh, your name to be associated with a decision where at least three judges said you weren't organized. Let's move on to oral arguments. The rules allow you to waive oral argument. And as you've learned in law school, you never ever waive oral argument. Uh, it's only 15 minutes. There may be judges who are on the fence or who are undecided who may have some questions to ask you. Um, you may be able to clarify something for them. You never, ever, ever waive oral argument as an appellate attorney. Again, if you don't know how to swim, you don't jump in the deep end. Uh, if you can't argue your position before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit sitting en banc, knowing that as soon as you stand up there, they're going to start asking you questions and not give you a chance to get to your prepared argument, don't jump in the water. Um, the, the second bullet that says answer questions directly when asked. I mean, everyone in here who didn't move court knows that. If you get a question, you never say, I'll get to that. Um, because just Judge Winter on the Fourth Circuit used to say, you're there now. <laughs> you're supposed to answer the question directly when asked and then get back to your arguments. And clarity comes from practice. Um, always have a moot court. Always, whether it's before your canary, your cat, your significant other, your mentor, somebody else, but you always have to practice what you say. Clarity comes from practice. All right, We're just about done. Keep the big picture in mind. What, what do we mean by this? Appellate litigation is like looking at um, Prince Charles of England, or Jimmy Durante. If you look at Prince Charles, 
you see the big ears, right? It's like a caricature. Um, you look at Jimmy Durante, you see the big nose. That's what you want the appellate court to focus on. You do not want the appellate court to get lost in the details. You do not want uh, a judge or a justice to go off on a tangent. And if you lead them down that road away from your main points, that's your fault. Um, and appellate lit litigators also understand that unlike television, um, appellate attorneys aren't there to entertain anyone. Your clients are usually not in the courtroom. You're not trying to impress anyone. Understand the realities of appellate argument before um, a panel of appellate judges. And the reality is that you're there to convince them that you are the MKP and they should agree with you. You are the most knowledgeable person in the courtroom. You're not trying to impress a client. You're not trying to impress a potential client. Um, you are trying to convince the appellate judges uh, who have read your brief and hopefully don't have anything negative to say about it, that even if you lose, they have to distinguish your cases. Um, they have to say something about why you lost. Um, so that's what it means when we say understand the realities. All right, the final point. Don't forget your manners in court. Um, be competent and confident um, because the, the judges are watching you. And there are a lot of little things, like when you refer to the justices who are asking you a question on the Supreme Court of Virginia, if you get one from Chief Justice Kinzer, you do not refer to her as Justice Kinzer. You refer to her as Chief Justice Kinzer. That's just what you do. Um, the State Bar publication that I told you that you can download from the Virginia State Bar's webpage, at the end of it, they have answers to frequently asked questions. And if you don't have time to read anything else, I think there are about 41 questions. Just read the frequently asked questions and the answers to the frequently asked questions at the end of the, um, the State Bar publication. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think of other little things in terms of manners, what you have to do. Oh, when you are referring to a prior decision of an appellate court, it could have been written by Chief Justice Roberts, but it is not Chief Justice Roberts' opinion because you need more than one person to get a decision from the Supreme Court. It is the opinion of the Supreme Court of, Virginia, of uh, the United States. Uh, it is the opinion of the Supreme Court in the in the, the so-and-so opinion. You, don't, you never refer to it as one judge's opinion. That judge might have authored the opinion for a majority of the judges or justices. Um, but these are just little things that you pick up from going through some of the materials. Always be mindful of your time. Um, again, those of you who did moot court know this. When the light comes on, you shut up and sit down and say thank you, whatever it is you had to say for your little um, closing comment, and you sit down. You never go over your time. Always be mindful of the 15 minutes. Um, those of you who did moot court, you know there are lights. Um, the green light comes on when you start. The yellow light comes on when you have two or three minutes left. But when the red light comes on, unless you are answering a question, and even if you never had the opportunity to get to the most important issue in your argument, um, you sit down because that's just being respectful. Red clearly means stop. All right, those are my 10 things you need to remember as an appellate attorney. Are there any questions? I told you I could be brief. All right, thank you.